Hello, people. Hello, friends. How are you today? It's a sunny afternoon here in Berlin in January, which is pretty nice. It's really good for my mental health, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So today I'm going to cover self-care. And uh, I've been wanting to talk about this for quite some time. And uh, today is the day. As I talk a lot about the health and well-being of survivors of trafficking and other forms of chronic trauma, and there's a lot of application crossover of those topics to the lives of those who serve them. But the most important of these topics is self-care. And so today I'm really talking to the caregivers. You know, self-care is important to those in recovery, absolutely, but it is vital to those who are working with survivors. We can't help others further than, when, than where we are ourselves. Furthermore, when helpers aren't in a healthy space, they can fall into traps of codependence or have their own healing wrapped up in the healing of others, which does really helps no one. Unhealthy people can wreak havoc in teams. Finally, a lack of good self-care can lead to burnout, depression, and other more serious health, uh, mental health problems. These issues are larger than a self-care plan can fix, but following a plan to take care of our mental health will help prevent us from falling into these hazards. So self-care is a hot topic these days, and it's great that people feel freer to talk about how important mental health and overall life balance are in our daily lives. However, a lot of what I hear and read about regarding self-care is not necessarily helpful. There's a big difference between nourishing self-care and practices that are escapist or merely distract us from our present tensions. You know, these latter kinds of escapist or relaxation activities, you know, they do have their role. I enjoy evening of wine and Netflix as much as the next person. You know, they help me relax and zone out a bit. But they don't lead to deeper inner well-being. You know, in principle, I tell myself, like, oh, I can do this, you know, it'll get me into a relaxed state and I can do deeper work. But I, normally, I haven't found that that's not the case. So in the same light, Self-care does not equal treat yourself. It's not that simple. Although treating yourself is a good thing once in a while, it's rather shallow. The danger of treating yourself is that it fuels a reward-seeking mindset and can trigger addictive behaviors. So self-care is not a list of activities. Self-care is a practice of maintaining a lifestyle that's generally balanced and sustainable. Self-care is not something you implement when you feel yourself getting a bit fried or burned out. I mean, it's not a parachute. Although measures do need to be taken at that point, you know, I just wouldn't call that self-care. You know, a good self-care plan includes daily, weekly, monthly, yearly practices and routines that form a rhythm to our lives and can help prevent burnout or at least mitigate the downtimes. Of course, there's always times and more often than we like when it's impossible to keep balance, you know, our life isn't perfect. And sometimes life happens at a pace that's unsustainable. I mean, life happens. But when these circumstances arise on the foundations of good self-care, then one has a resilience to survive, if not thrive through them. It's also possible that life crises or super hectic circumstances either seem to occur less frequently, or they don't seem so overwhelming because a good foundation of resilience you know, has been built up and that buffers impacts. And we do have extra tools then to help keep us steady and maintain better judgment in our decisions and our life day to day. So I'm not going to tell you why you need to practice self-care. You already know that you need to. I'm also not going to tell you what to do because only you can figure that out. What I am going to do here is outline some basic principles of self-care and self-care planning. But I'll also, I need to address the idea, maybe a myth, that self-care is a woman's thing. It is not. Okay, so a lot of articles are written by women, from women's perspective, for women. But hey, guys, we need you strong. We need you to take care of yourselves. And, you know, I'm not going to suggest anything here that's more feminine or masculine we all need to take care of ourselves and we need to learn some tools, maybe some principles about how to do that better. So self-care or self-care plan slash lifestyle or MO has several components and understanding these foundations can help you develop a plan that works for you. These activities can and 
probably should change based on where you are in your life stage and current environment. In my experience, the practices are basically the same, but the way I carry them out in my routine differs. Well, self-care is not only a list of activities, self-care does eventually boil down to what you choose to do or not to do. But I want to uh, read a quote here now by Nadia Boltzweber. So she says, on the outside, my plan looked like good self-care, but really it was just a laundry list of habits I adopted to ensure I could continue to overfunction. Now, when I read that, well, that hit me right between the eyes. I mean, this really resonated with me because that's a lot of what my self-care has been sometimes. And uh, maybe it resonates with you as well. So have a think about that. You know, are you doing these things just so you can keep over functioning or are you really growing and growing deeper in your self-care practices? So there's three basic elements of self-care and they're one, self-awareness, two, inputs, uh, internal, external, and three, discipline. So self-awareness is the first key to good self-care. So without self-awareness, how do you know how to care for yourself? You know, how do you know when you're nourished? What, how do you know what nourishes you? You know, who are you and what do you want? What are your resilience factors and resources, either internal and external? What are the things inside you that, what are your strength factors inside? And, and what are some things that are outside, maybe family or friends that are help that are resources to you? You know, what are your threats and weaknesses? Uh, these are internal, external. What are your, what are your weaknesses that kind of get you down or what are some external threats um, at the moment or maybe on a regular basis? But how do we develop self-awareness? You know, a lot of it is experience, life, um, some of it's experimentation and trial and error. Like, how do we know what really nourishes you? Well, you might try something. You might read an article that outlines the 10 steps to self-care or the last self-care plan you will ever try and then think, well, that's a load of rubbish. How can people think that bubble baths are the best thing since sliced bread? You know, it's okay to disregard someone else's advice and it's okay to try something and not have it work for you. It's also very okay to try something that sounds good to you, but a little crazy to most people, you know. For example, you know, many of you know, I like to run for hours and hours at a time. And normally I, I almost always, I do this without music, no podcasts, nothing but the thoughts in my head. And I'll run until I run out of thoughts. And then I'm in Zen mode. I'm fully present to myself. And that's a kind of uh, active meditation, if you will. So, you know, self-awareness. And you can gain self-awareness through journaling, or other meditation practices, or just figuring out, or like, what do I tend to do when I want to make myself feel better? Um, so these are some ideas. So the poet Rainier Maria Rilke, has written, uh, be attentive to what is arising within you and place that above everything else. What is happening at your innermost self is worthy of your entire love. Somehow you must find a way to work at it. So the second uh, key element are inputs and inputs are the various practices and habits and activities that we can implement. External inputs are those things that we do with other people and internal are the things that we do alone. So everyone needs a combination of internal and external inputs. Although I think that being introverted or extroverted will influence the amount of time spent in one or the other type, both are very important. So here's an example, exercise. You know, there's group sports and activities that you do alone. Uh, but so running, for example, you know, my favorite topic, uh, will you run alone or with a group? And so running, I do most of my running alone, but I do enjoy group runs. I enjoy running with others and catch up and talk. It kind of helps pass the long miles or kilometers um, by. And so exercise, there's group sports or activities that we do alone. So running, this is my favorite topic. So 
I mostly run by myself because, you know, I'm on a schedule and I've got to get stuff done. And I also have a training regimen that I need to adhere to. But once a week or every other week, I'll join a group of buddies and we'll go out and spend long kilometers together and and laugh and, and relax, but, you know, push ourselves as well. And so there's that balance of doing something alone and then with others. Singing is another great example, a great way to relieve stress, enjoy with others. So an external form would be joining a choir. An internal example would be singing solo. Yeah, I have a friend uh, in China and she, after a stressful day, she would love to go to a karaoke place and sing solo karaoke for a couple hours. And that was her decompressing. That was her way of, of relaxing. And I thought that was fantastic. Uh, so everyone has their own thing and um, finding your way. A good, another example of an external output could be meeting regularly with a friend for an honest check-in. I mean, you're intentional about getting to the things that matter. Another example is meeting with a spiritual director or a prayer partner to help, you know, articulate what's going on in your own life. A meeting with a partner in a mutual uh, back and forth meeting is also good because if you're open, then pe someone is listening to you, but you're also opening and listening and holding space for someone else. And so this, this thing in its various forms, I think is a great benefit. And I, this is one thing I do recommend um, doing, um, but then again, it's, it's not necessary. I don't always have this in my own practice. So inputs also don't necessarily have to be people or activities that directly give you input. You know, important version of an external input is to do something for others. You know, it's very important that we don't consider self-care as only curling up and navel gazing activities. It's no secret. And it's been scientifically proven that doing something for others, volunteering, mentoring, tutoring, etc., not just giving money will do something in and for you. So there's a wide range of possibilities here. One place with, to start would be to consider, you know, what hobbies you've enjoyed in the past that you're no longer doing right now for whatever reason, you know, could you restart one? I was giving a self-care talk and one time and one of the participants says, oh yeah, I, I thought of uh, embroidery. You know, that's, that's some, I like to sit and I like the meditative process. I like the idea of creating something and then, I like to say that, well, now I've accomplished something that's beautiful. And so perhaps there's things that you love, but neglected due to other life circumstances. You know, is there a way to do something like that? Bring it back or another version of that in some different way. You know, just have a think about that. So the third key element is discipline. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the execution of whatever inputs, activities, or plans we want to do. You don't have time to do the things you should because you do not make the time. A self-care plan should not be so rigid as to cause stress if we aren't following it. But often, if not always, it requires some sacrifice in order to carry it out. When we've learned what is not helping us move forward in wholeness, we need to put that down if we are going to have space to pick up that thing that will help move us forward. If you aren't willing to drop anything, then you've either got your life sorted and you don't need a plan or something will give out eventually. And it is usually the new thing. There is always give and take and there is the habit forming process. Just how bad do you want to achieve your goal? Here are some aspects to developing discipline. You know, set reasonable expectations for yourself. I mean, don't think you're going to go out and exercise like every day, but maybe 30 minutes, three times a week and establish a rhythm and stick to it. Get out of bed 15 minutes early. Commit to that 10 minute meditation app. Even if you're not fully present, you'll adapt, you'll change, you'll get in the habit and your brain and your body will get used to a new routine and it will thank you for it. You can say to yourself, I will put down my blinking phone and go to bed 30 minutes early. Uh, you know, get up go to bed early, get up earlier, you know, make the time for what you want to do. Establish reasonable boundaries with yourself and others. I mean, you know, this is going to take some work. Um, your, my friends, 
ask me, oh, we're going to go out with friends. And I say, well, you know, that's not really what I need to do right now. I'm really tired. Or what I really want to do is read a good book with my butt stitched to the sofa. And so I'll tell my friends that I've got other plans. Uh, I'm not lying because those are definitely plans. It just happens to be by myself. Also, you know, an example, I need time with friends. I love cards and board games, but I also need to train hard for my ultra marathons. So that's also a stress reliever. So you have to balance like, mm, am I going to go out? Um, I'm going to go to my friend's house, but I'm going to get up early to train. And so I might lose a bit of sleep to get that, but then I'll say no to doing that two nights in a row, for example. So, uh, find out a rhythm that works for you and, you know, work with it. Um, over the last 20 years of cross-cultural service, you know, I have a lot of experience with self-care, partly because I did not practice good self-care for part of the time, or maybe most of the time on and off. Anyway, I got burned out and crispy fried a couple of times. I learned the hard way, but I am still here. I sometimes ignored advice because it wasn't for me. The suggested activities weren't appropriate for me, like bubble baths or singing worship songs to myself. Or Sometimes I felt like I was being forced to meet somebody for a so-called accountability partner, and that seemed perfunctory. Uh, I eventually did find a way to keep myself healthy. Uh, this doesn't mean that I don't struggle, have down or difficult or angry times. It does mean that through a growing awareness, recognizing the inputs that nourish me and implementing the discipline to do them, I can recognize when I need to tighten up my routine, relax a bit from my work and get back into balance. There's no magic plan, nothing magical about it. You know, self-care should be challenging enough to keep us stimulated and not bored, but not so difficult as to be unsustainable. You know, recognize where you are. Start right there right here, right now, and go. So I'm going to leave in closing uh, with a quote by Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen. And she says, protecting ourselves from loss rather than grieving and healing our losses is one of the major causes of burnout. So have a think about that. Please reach out to me in the comments below via my website contact. I love to hear how you're doing, how this has helped you or not. Let's talk about it. See you soon. Bye.